Good afternoon. Welcome to our Hello Tomorrow X Solvay webinar on transitioning the chemical industry through biotechnologies. As a reminder, the panel discussion will last 45 minutes with 15 minutes for Q&A, so please post your questions in the designated question box. My name is Rainbow Lowe. I'm the chemistry and materials expert at Hello Tomorrow. To give you a little bit more information about what we do, we're a global organization that aims to solve some of our world's most pressing challenges through innovative deep tech solutions. We have our four key pillars to achieve this mission. The first is our global challenge, our early stage deep tech startup competition. Second, our annual global summit taking place in March in Paris in France, where we bring together our key stakeholders such as founders, corporate scientists and investors. We also work with corporations to provide tailor-made services on open innovation across industries and technologies. Finally, for our investor network, we regularly share investment opportunities and carry out introductions with startups for, for, from our community. We're very excited to partner with Solvay, who is sponsoring our industrial biotech and new materials track for the Global Challenge, and who will also be attending the Global Summit in March. Today, we are joined by an excellent panel, Biomatech from Solvay, DMC, Ginkgo Bioworks, and IndieBio. So without further ado, Kevin, Matt, Tomas, and Poe, please present your elevator pitch for your company and organization. I'll start, I'm Kevin Madden. I help lead business development at, at Ginkgo Bioworks. Real pleasure to represent Ginkgo Bioworks and to, to be part of the webinar. Ginkgo is the company whose mission is broadly to make biology easier to engineer, right? And our business model is to provide cell engineering services to market leaders in a variety of sectors. And when these companies then receiving a license from to the underlying technology to make and sell products and share an appropriate portion of that value back to Ginkgo. Today, we have more than 80 major programs active on our platform, and we're looking to consolidate more of the world's cell engineering needs at Ginkgo to both bring down the development costs and to realize the other benefits of the learnings and thereby make biology more predictable. Today, there are eight products that have been commercialized through our, through our technologies, and happy to say many more are pretty far down the pipe. Uh, Corporate Facts, we're a company of well over 1,000 employees. Boston is our home, but we have additional labs across the river in Cambridge, also in Emeryville and in West Sacramento in California, and three sites uh, in Europe as well. And the company was taken public in, in 2021, and in the course of that, we raised $1.6 billion dollars uh, in gross capital, and, and we look forward to sharing that capital to continue to expand our platform and to share in risk with a variety of partners. Um, thanks. I hand over to Matt. Great. Thanks. Uh, my name is Matt Lipscomb. I'm the CEO and, and founder of DMC Biotechnologies. So we are a precision fermentation company uh, that has been built on a technology platform that was explicitly designed and we have now demonstrated to address the challenge of efficiently getting to scale. Um, so we have products with markets in chemicals, materials, uh, and also ingredients. So think of sort of food, flavor, and ingredients broadly. Um, we also have projects with some blue chip partners helping them to achieve their de decarbonization goals, as well as addressing some of the challenges they face with uh, some of the hazards of the materials uh, that they're using today. We have locations in Boulder, Colorado, which is where I'm located, as well as Durham, North Carolina. Uh, and we work globally with, uh, with partners uh, you know, across the supply chain. Um, so we have most recently, so about a year ago, closed a Series B financing, uh, and we're grateful to get that in before the, the economy changed, if you will. So looking forward to the, to the panel and the discussions today. Okay, so I, I go next. So I'm Thomas Canova, working at Solvay, uh, which is a global leader in, in advanced materials solutions and, and chemicals. And uh, well, even if it that can be a bit misleading because it's a sunny day, I'm actually based in Brussels, Belgium, and I have a double hat. So I, I manage Solvay Ventures, the venture capital fund of Solvay, partnering uh, uh, deep tech startups in their journey. And I also lead the growth platform focused on renewable materials and biotech, aiming uh, at developing brand new businesses in that space. So I'm also looking forward 
to discussing with uh, with the other members of uh, of the webinar. It's a great opportunity. And thank you, Thomas. Uh, hi, everyone. It's nice to see you today. My name is Poe Bronson. I am the managing director of IndieBio, and I'm based in San Francisco. IndieBio is the uh, a division of the venture capital firm SOSV, and we are the birthplace of many companies who have been born and built uh, in the lab and facilities at IndieBio uh, and at Hacks. Uh, to help explore this new transition to sustainable chemistry across our world. Uh, we're the birthplace of about 200 different companies that collectively have a value of about $11 billion. Uh, we're like a feeder system, you might say. Um, we have companies that uh, Solve has invested in. We're very proud of that. We have companies that we have sold to Ginkgo. Uh, virtually every climate investor in the world has done a deal with a company that was sort of originally born and built at indie bio and we play kind of um a very sensitive and and tricky role of that playing that sort of zero to one role last year at hello tomorrow we met two different founders that we've taken forward gotten funded gotten through their rounds put in a very great position to succeed and we're always looking for the next uh idea that is different that separates, we're not looking for the same thing someone else is doing, just always relentlessly looking for something that could be another way to try this. Great to be with you today. Thank you. So as you can see, our panelists have a variety of backgrounds and also they have a huge diversity across the SynBio landscape. I guess to start off with, I will pose this to Tomas. In a nutshell, What's the future of the chemical industry? Okay, so uh, first of all, it's, it's really great to be here today speaking about the future of the chemical industry, but also with my colleagues around this uh, virtual table discussing how biotechnologies could drive the necessary changes in, the, in this industry. Right? So at Solvay, we definitely see great potential. So in fact, we recently launched a growth platform focused exactly on renewable materials and biotechnology, which I have the, the honor to, to lead. And this platform uh, privileges a holistic approach to based on eco-design and focused on three pillars. So first, we look at the origin, sustainable, renewable feedstocks, but also uh, we look at the processes used to convert these feedstocks into, uh, 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 into the chemicals we want. Those processes, they need to be sustainable. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense for us to go for, for that. And finally, caring about the end of life uh, management, so uh, uh, how to uh, close the loop to recycling or biodegradable solutions. But to the chemical industry, and, and we, start, we should start by acknowledging that the chemical industry has played a vital role in shaping our modern world. So from aerospace, automotive, construction, healthcare, the chemical industry has had a profound impact in our daily lives. And if all of us, if we look around us, Everything that we see is somehow enabled by this, by, by this industry. But of course, if we look towards the future, there are important challenges. And the most important driver of change uh, uh, for, this, uh, for this industry, in the chemical industry, is the increasing demand for sustainability. Uh, this can be achieved through reducing waste emissions, investing in more renewable energy, uh, transitioning to a, a more circular model, a more circular economy. But this transition uh, to a carbon neutral future requires, in all those cases, a radical transformation in how chemicals are designed. And so when we talk about the future, it's also talking about new ways of delivering those uh, new solutions. Now, if we bring that to the context of biotechnologies specifically, together with the digital component, which is uh, for sure uh, uh, another transformative component, biotechnologies represent a unique opportunity for for the chemical industry to reinvent the way products are made. And, and, and let me be very clear here, just to, uh, to start uh, on that. So it's not a competition between chemistry and biology. They often come together and they get along pretty well. So uh, uh, chemistry needs the power of biology to reach new highs in terms of uh, uh, sustainability. And biology shall benefit from all the available chemical knowledge to become increasingly affordable and present in our, in our lives. So, in fact, uh, by the end of 2030, it's very likely that synthetic biology will account 
for more than a third of, global, of the global output in manufacturing industries. And biotechnology is expected to have an estimated economic impact of more than two trillion euros annually by 2040. And so this is for sure an exciting journey also for the chemical industry. I 100% agree with everything Thomas said. <laughs> Let's start with just history. You know, in schools, we're taught that it was the assembly line and manufacturing that over the last century that built our economy. And it's amazing how chemistry is hidden from sort of every school children's eyes over the last two centuries of being this incredible kind of quiet partner in enabling everything that we literally do in this world. And it's very exciting to live at this time. Uh, we all feel a time like the world is full of these problems and we have these disasters looming ahead that force us to change. But it's also an incredibly exciting time because we get to, we, we get to live at the birth of this transformation to reinventing all of the means of production to do so with less energy, with higher performance, and with less toxicity. And agreeing again with Thomas that it is not about biology replacing chemistry. Every one of my best companies in this space is using biology and chemistry steps in making compounds that deliver on those same, same three goals. And it is really exciting how biology can actually bring a uh, a more because it's all done at extremely low energy, like a cell runs on a single picowatt of energy. I mean, it's incredible. A human being runs on two AA batteries, like it's incredible, but it's all done at low energy. It also can do more nuanced chemistry, finer chemistry than we do with petroleum chemistry. I'll be very clear what it's not. The future of chemistry is not just replacing oils of feedstock. That is not enough to get things started. It has to have deliver on uh, lower toxicity for the world and higher performance, uh, be equal in cost or lower, improve margins and be lower energy. And it takes a lot of creativity. And I think that's an exciting part of it is to fill the industry in our minds with very, very creative people to find new ways to accomplish this reinvention of the means of production. So I think it's fantastic that we can hear that both chemistry and biotech can work. What I'm hearing is in synergy in order to bring our new technologies to new heights. So Poe and Tomas, I guess, what would you see in terms of the current techno industry trends um, in terms of the biotech space and a little bit more broadly, like what are you seeing now and potentially in the future? Paul, would you like to start? Sure, Thomas. Thank you. Um, uh, the one thing I need everyone to know is, because it sounds so amazing. I mean, like, Ginkgo is amazing, and and what, what Matt's doing is amazing. But this stuff is really hard. Like, it's very hard to talk people into giving up capital to try these, you know, what they see as very risky things. And so we have trends, but it does take a kind of a boldness and intelligence about these markets. Like the single biggest trend is in biotech, I would say is an anti-trend. It's a reaction by venture to be scared of the scale up challenge. The very things that Matt has actually succeeded at doing and Ginkgo has succeeded at doing are the very things that other people are afraid the next company in line can't do and is running out of capacity. And you're seeing, uh, if you pay someone to do your manufacturing for you, we're seeing the prices have gone up 250%. And if you try to buy your own bioreactors, those are on a year delay. And there's really struggles in these markets that are scaring investors right now. And so I just salute everybody here because it's there. there's a lot of pressures against this when it comes from a venture capital markets perspective, despite the entire world saying, you know, hey, um, can we reinvent some of these plastics? Can we do some things without toxicity? Can we reduce our emissions? And the world is dying for this stuff, uh, but it's not easy. Uh, and I would say 
that's the biggest trend of all right now, which is uh, working through this temp this period of difficulty to get more companies scaled up, more companies as proof points that this can be done. And what Thomas is saying that by 2030, one third of, of what will be happening will be coming through biochemistry. I agree with that. But this is the it's we need more evidence, more success stories. And once we have those, that'll make it a lot easier to sort of repeat this in different markets. With this key challenge, which is that venture capitalists, like we're not we're far from perfect, we have our biases. And one is we want these category defining companies. We want to win everything. We want to create the Google of chemistry or the Apple of biochemistry, like massive things that just suck up every startup and every bit of talent and they're incredibly huge. And I don't think that's the answer here. None of us at Intubio do. We think that in different markets, different technologies will win and different approaches can win. And we think it'll be a very, very heterogeneous market. And to some extent that fights against what VCs want in this space. Yeah, and just building on what uh, Paul just said. So uh, one of the amazing things that uh, we see in biotech today is that even that reason for, uh, for venture capitalists to stay uh, uh, a bit reluctant on investing in companies is uh, is now uh, disappear slowly disappearing because uh, scaling uh, a biotech process is becoming more and more predictable based on the work that has been done by by companies like the ones that are around the, this uh, virtual table so which is which is great so it's also part of the transformation we are going through but, but uh, 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 about sustainability before as a driver of change. But if we become more granular, I would also say a carbon capture and the use of carbon coming from CO2 to produce chemicals, it's also a clear trend towards a carbon negative products. So yes, from, a, from the term, term, a thermodynamics perspective, there are enormous challenges when we want to think about that. But uh, this approach is definitely uh, a trend. And we've been seeing companies progressing uh, pretty well in this field with product offerings that uh, we thought it, it wouldn't be possible, let's say, 10 years ago. Um, I would also say, so there is some debate on, uh, an interesting debate on cell-free systems and on, on whether those, uh, those systems, when scaled to real industrial conditions, will be able to keep the, the advantages presented at the lower scale. When it comes to cost competitiveness and carbon footprint, uh, for sure. And once again, a lot going on in that space. Uh, food tech too, but uh, Paul, it's a, it's a, uh, it's in a privileged position uh, uh, in IndieBio to to talk more about that. But an extremely exciting space where we're seeing a lot going on, biologicals in ag. So I, I can li I could eventually list uh, four, no, uh, four or five other uh, uh, talks. But the last one I would like to highlight is not that much about technology or biotechnology, but it's about data and the importance that the data is having uh, uh, in that transformation. So it's about data being used not only to better develop products, strains, uh, or processes, but also as a way to get access to some new business models. So it's about how value is progressively shifting from product solutions to a blend of products with information contained in, in them, and how uh, this package of information properly structured, stored, protected, can be combined with other packages often coming from third parties. And so back to the point that Kevin was making on open innovation, blending uh, a data coming from different sources to produce brand new value propositions in that space too. Thank you. I think it's fascinating to see how the trends are changing, what's currently happening and what's currently progressing in the future. Because this SynBio landscape, I would say, is very fluid, um, I guess it's also quite an exciting period to be a startup. So I would love to hear from Kevin and Matt in terms of how does the incumbent industry work with startups? Like, how is the current industry working with both of you uh, companies? I can start, Matt, if, if you'd like. Um, so um, to be clear, Ginkgo works with a wide range of partners, ranging from those comprised strictly of founders to, to Fortune 500 companies, right? And 
with startups, the value proposition is quite simple and, and hopefully clear, right? So the message is why build or expand a lab with your most precious equity capital when you can leverage existing capabilities and infrastructure at Ginkgo, right? Oftentimes having better set starting points for the, the related development, right? And this allows those partners to focus their capital and resources on developing and defining the products and differentiating uh, the ultimate way that they're gonna create value, but they, they leverage a common infrastructure for the basic development that's happening through the synthetic biology. On business terms, we offer different scenarios. I think it's important to offer all sorts of partners optionality in how they interface with, with Ginkgo, right? They could take the more traditional Ginkgo model of <coughs> blending our compensation and some range of regular fees, milestone payments when we deliver on risk reducing re uh, results. And then what Ginkgo requires is that we share appropriately in the value that's created at the end of the day. Uh, most typically that's either through a royalty or sub-licensing fee, depending on the business model of that company. But we're also able to simplify that and, and make it one or a series of payments if, if that's in the best interest of the partners. But, so that's one way that we could interact uh, with startup companies, quite similar to how we interact with uh, more, more established companies. Alternatively, in lieu of near-term cash compensation, we can take some compensation in the form of equity, right? And, and that's largely made possible because of Ginkgo's equity or capital uh, position today, right? So in lieu of taking cash for fees and milestones, we'll vest equity and, and then still uh, require some sharing of the ultimate value created, similar to what I, I described uh, above for the, or for the kind of traditional uh, Ginkgo model. Right. To be clear, like the taking of equity is not intended to become a typical financial investor. We're doing this to offer our partners optionality, right? So at the end of the day, Ginkgo is a platform company. We're not looking to invest in specific product opportunities. We're rather looking to enable an industry, right? And so taking equity as, as a financial uh, compensation is really a tool to enable the consolidation and make it more amenable to a wider range of partners. Right. So happy to share a few thoughts on, on this as well. I think um, as many companies with a technology platform can relate to, uh, I think one of the challenges is when you have so many options in front of you, where, what do you go after, right? So you have the ability to produce many different things, but what should you produce and why? And when I think about the commercial path or, or bringing a, a product into the marketplace, there are you know, sort of three big buckets that you need to check off at the end of the day. So you need a technology that hits a certain set of performance metrics that ultimately provide you know, the cost as well as the decarbonization metrics that you're trying to achieve. You need the ability to manufacture it at large scale. Uh, and oftentimes, as you've already heard, um, that's, it's just cost prohibitive to do that yourself, uh, at least initially. And then you also need the market side. Um, so you need a, a confirmed market, a confirmed value proposition, and you need customers that are willing to buy it at the price points and volumes at which you can produce it. And so one of the ways we think about working with partners, particularly strategic partners, is that we then no longer have to check all of those boxes ourselves, right? So obviously we can provide the technology that hits the desired metrics, but if we have the right partners who can provide either the manufacturing assets or the ability or the commitment to build that asset, and then they can also provide the confirmation on the market side, whether that's from their own intimate knowledge, whether that's a channel to market, whether that's complete internal consumption, uh, there are a variety of different ways that can be answered. But you can imagine you know, working with a partner where instead of us having to provide all three buckets to get to commercial, we only have to provide sort of the technology and then the partner can provide either the manufacturing and or the market side. So I think when you find those fits, uh, it can be a really, really powerful combination. That's great to hear, thank you. Um, I'd also love to hear from the perspective of IndieBio so Poe and also Tomas from Solve, how are you seeing in terms of what is the incumbent industry working and what are they doing with startups through your lenses? Right. 
virtually every one of our startups partners with larger corporates and it's fantastic and it's happening earlier now which is really fantastic why is it critical well certainly again going back to see the bias of vc vc wants the startup to own all of the revenue stack and what they mean is they they want you to take all the value and don't give it to a partner um but we also tell all of our startups, you have to focus. You have to do one thing. Just be doing this thing. And unfortunately, that's not how our minds work. That's not how businesses work. And so really good examples of this are, are our companies that have made, a, say, a single invention and are also working on a second invention. And they can take that first invention. And in order to focus on the second, they partner out on that first. And so let's say it's a bio one six hexane dial uh, where it's set up with a JV and a rev share and the corporate partners literally handling everything, not just the manufacturing, but also the sales and distribution from that point. And that's enabling our startup to stay lean and stay focused on the next product, which is a bio S super absorbent polymer. And I think this structure has been, it's, it's gotten quite mature, uh, we definitely have to train our startups to understand that uh, all of the large corporates can be fantastic partners and are not really there to steal your business because there's an inherent deep suspicion around this. And we just have to coach it out of them um, because it's just again and again been, been really a godsend to our startups to to work with different corporates in, in all of the structures really that that Kevin was describing. Yep, and so uh, as part of a of a, a big corporate, I would say we we are uh, in contact with uh, 100, hundreds of startups uh, at the same time, and so there are different. There is no single uh, answer to the uh, uh, to that question. So are different ways of interacting with them. We recognize. We start by recognizing that most of the of the key innovation. Uh, although we have our internal problems in 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 many different areas, but uh, uh, that frontier, the science frontier, is being changed every every day, and and most of the the innovations will come from abroad. So we need to remain attentive, interacting with those that are really, let's say, pushing the boundaries of of what we uh, we know. And I would say uh, that uh, in terms of interactions, uh, that could go from a, uh, from a partnership. So we might have a partnership focused on a specific development. Or we can go beyond if we see strategic benefit to do that uh, uh, to do that move and become an investor uh, in in one of the companies on or those companies. But I would say the important component for for a company like uh, ours uh, is to understand the value that we can bring uh, on the top of the money that could come through an investment or through an, a partnership. And I think that was mentioned also uh, by uh, by Matt uh, and and Kevin, right? So beyond the money that is being invested, it's important uh, to be in a position to bring something else, like uh, uh, to become a first adopter or uh, to support the, the development uh, of the startup with the methodologies, mentorship, channels to, uh, to some specific markets. I think that, that what, that's what really makes the difference. 2020 is a pretty per year in terms of uh, capital, right? So, and it's also a, a difficult year for the, and it will be a difficult year for the VC industry. So money will be relatively less available uh, this year than it was in the previous years. But still, what matters the most in an interaction like that is to understand from the strategic perspective, strategic perspective, how to join forces between uh, 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 those two companies. Um, Tomas, it's quite interesting that you're talking about the economic climate because we have some quite interesting data um, based over the last three years, so between 2019 and 2022. If we look at the deal count, so deal count being how many funding deals they had completed, uh, VCs had completed with startups, we've seen that this has increased within three years by 2.5 times. If we look at the amount of money invested in dollars, this has increased by six times. And if we look and we compare against different industries, the deal count was up in 2022, whilst in other VC sectors, this was down. 
So it's quite evident that the SynBio space is very up and coming. It's very explosive. One of the key things that would be quite interesting to hear is why now? So we know we're getting a lot of traction. We know the SynBio landscape is growing exponentially. So what's changed in the biotech world that indicates that now is the time? Um, and I'd love to get your thoughts on it, um, both Kevin and Matt. Sure. Uh, I'll start off this one, Kevin, if that's okay. Um, so I think there are a variety of things that are different this time around than say, you know, industrial biotech 1.0 in the sort of the mid 2000s. So I think the, the first is that consumers are truly demanding an increase in sustainability and decarbonization. So their, their buying habits have changed and they're requiring that the products that they buy, that they buy today, whether that's a consumer, a consumer product good, a you know, personal care product, sneakers, whatever it may be, they're actually demanding and they're willing to pay more for sustainability as part of those products. And then as you move up the value chain from the consumers, you're starting to see the, the brands that serve those consumers respond. And as you move further up the value chain, the chemical industry is responding. So they're responding to their customers who are demanding this, demanding increases in sustainability and decarbonization. They wanna know where their products are coming from. And then I, I think the, the final element of that is you're now starting to see some significant regulatory changes as well, right? So in, in the US, there was the um, Inflation Reduction Act that's putting a lot of emphasis on biomanufacturing, on strengthening supply chains, uh, on reshoring or friendshoring, if you will. And SynBio and Precision Fermentation is uniquely positioned to be a part of all of that solution. Um, in, in Europe, I, I think the other big regulatory success from a decarbonization perspective has been the carbon border adjustment mechanism, where you're now actually starting to price in the true carbon cost of incumbents, right? So no longer will, uh, you know, less scrupulous players be able to simply import from a region that, you know, makes things from coal, right? So you're actually starting to price in the real cost of those incumbents. And that has a major level setting uh, effect, right? When, when an incumbent can force negative externalities, you know, onto the public and instead of having to pay for them themselves, that's that's a very that's a, a very big advantage. So I think, like I said, there are some major changes in the world today that all lend uh, lend support towards um, you know these emerging industrial biotech applications. Yeah, I'll be brief with a a few additions, right? So I, I very much agree with with Matt's points, right? But I think there's really a a bit of a perfect storm of factors. And some of those factors are under the control of companies like DMC and Ginkgo, right? So we're starting to more reliably deliver on promises that we've made in an industry that historically has under delivered, right? So for sure, there's continues to be a very active technology revolution and the tools improve as well as the understanding of historical limitations. So we, we can more credibly project uh, timelines and costs for for development. And, and then on top of that, it's convergence of all the factors a bit outside of our control or less under our control. And these include the, you know, opinions, thoughts of the, the government of corporations, frankly, the public's opinions on matters such as sustainability and biosecurity, right? And they're, they're all aligning to create a, a super exciting opportunity for us to kind of prove the potential of our industry. Thanks. That's fantastic. So it's the sort of brewing of a perfect storm in terms of regulations, in terms of customer demand, in terms of the drive of more sustainability. So I'm hearing a lot of key drivers for this uh, transition, but I would also love to hear what type of transition, uh, what type of challenges you would see for this transition to here. I'd like to take a step back and potentially Tomas and Poe could um, answer first, and then we can zoom in into SynBio. Okay, so uh, so there is a cost for a transition like this, and so and this means that the, the right policies are needed at the right time, at least at, the, at at least in the beginning to stimulate the industry to go beyond the tipping point, uh, the point of no return, and uh, and that's that's pretty important. So uh, Europe is trying to to progress with the uh, uh, with the Green Deal and everything that has been derived from the, the Green Deal. We recently had the executive order 
coming from the Biden administration on biomanufacturing in the U.S. So the policymakers, they are uh, making uh, uh, the step. Uh, they, they are doing the, the, the right moves, and this is important. On the other hand, the consumer is also becoming more and more demanding, and we can feel that uh, uh, through our customers, but, uh, but also so if, if we, we, we discuss with our kids, we can, we can feel that pretty strongly, which is great. And so uh, those consumers, they also need to become more and more aware, uh, aware about the costs for, for, such, for such change. And the industry needs to be more effective on communicating on those. And I, I would say, uh, if we look at, uh, uh, at, uh, at the people that is now joining our companies, that's probably the, far, the first generation that learn sustainability at school, which is great but they also come with challenges. We need to respond to, the, to those challenges. And, and this and, and everything, we, uh, there is a, a change in state. We need to move to, from state A to state B. There is a need to, to properly manage that transition, which is not an easy thing. And uh, I will say on the top of that, uh, even if looking at biotech, the momentum is very good one. If we look around, there are important geopolitical changes, uh, including war, region, uh, regionalization, and that brings anxiety, that brings uh, a lack of visibility, market volatility, which makes more difficult to take both decisions when it comes to capital. And I would say, finally, uh, uh, the last challenge I would highlight is about talents uh, or talent shortage. Uh, uh, take it uh, as you want. So. We need more and more the best to succeed in, in, in such a highly competitive field as biotech is. And it, it's been more difficult to attract and retain the right talents in that space. So that's what I would see, let's say, in a nutshell, as, uh, as challenges for this transition to happen. I agree with everything Thomas said. I'll add to this, this critical dimension, which is... Um, we talk a lot about patient capital. We celebrate the stories of entrepreneurs who fought for 10 years against the odds to finally you know, get to market. Um, that is asking water to roll uphill. Uh, I hate to say it, but the single biggest impediment is the speed market. And that's what's making this exciting, which is all these new tools that allow us to create companies and product lines that can get to market faster. But that is the most critical tension. It's not the amount of money. In fact, the amount of money that will go in will be 10x or 100x what we've already seen if we can reduce the time to market. Uh, that period of time creates uh, enormous impatience in the world of capital and you can just scold it and say, stop being so impatient. Uh, that doesn't actually solve it. Um, solving it is things like Ginkgo's platform that enables things to do this faster. You know, Solvay's new platform that enables us to do this faster. And uh, I, we just did a company that does the very, very boring market of medium density fiber board to replace the formaldehyde that's ubiquitous in the medium density fiber board. It's a $60 billion market. Most of us never even see this fiber board. It's behind our walls or under our floors or inside of our IKEA furniture. We did a company that's actually making it now. And they're making it now and they're making you know, more money at it than, than you normal, normal fiber board, not by charging a higher premium, but by lowering costs. And the ability at pre-seed stage to say, yeah, we have revenue and like by in the next year, we're going to have $9 million in revenue. Investors love it. They're like, where are more Synbio companies like this that can just make products and sell them? Like, uh, I think that is important for everybody to understand. And we can and we deserve hero worship of those who've gone through this long journey to get to market now. But the next set of companies have to happen faster for it to use a lot of private capital to transform our industry. It's just the single biggest challenge. And thank you for your um, your summary for the key challenges. I think it's really important to keep in mind um, what could be changed, what we could see in the future. 
Um, in terms of zooming in into a little bit more of a sin bio lens in terms of seeing um, the key challenges that, for example, Ginkgo Bioworks and DMC face, would love to hear your thoughts. So I'd like to bring Kevin and Matt to speak. Yep, Matt, I'll start if, if that's all right. So uh, I, I think uh, just out of the gates, similar themes to what Poe raised there, right? And we, we certainly need to continue to get better, faster, cheaper, right? And Ginkgo is trying to do its part by consolidating cell engineering, which also means consolidating that learning uh, so that we have a higher probability of success and, and better starting points and thus shorter development times, right? That's our, our, our key premise. Uh, but similar approaches need to be applied at different portions of the value chain. Uh, pilot scale validation testing and full scale manufacturing, super capital intensive um, operations, right? And, and we need, and they've historically been housed within vertically in integrated companies. We need to have methods to make those more modularized. And so the capital costs or whatever costs don't get loaded on a small number of products, right? So that these can be multi-purpose facilities that are satisfying the needs of a variety of uh, companies in the industry. Intellectual property is another topic that we're, we need to wrestle with, right? So how can companies protect their business, their products, but still leverage the common code of synthetic biology, right? We have to stop wasting development capital by companies doing the same thing time and time again. Recognize that there's a challenge. To how does government best participate in this process, right? They, government has long been a, uh, an enabler of, uh, of innovation, right? How can it continue to do so and, and perhaps more so? Importantly, we also have to set a common set of metrics and incentives so that the industry can measure itself and incentivize performance to increase sustainability, renewability, right? So super exciting topics, but formidable challenges, right? So I look forward to working with others on the webinar and certainly across uh, in the industry to try to address these challenges. So. Yeah, so building on, on some of Kevin's thoughts, and, and I agree with, with everything that he said as well. You know, I think um, on the Synbio or the precision fermentation side, you know, we've been able to demonstrate getting to scale for multiple products with consistent performance faster than ever, right? So through the course of our Series A funding, and we had raised quite a bit less than many others in the space, we had multiple products at commercial metrics at scale, right? So from our perspective, that, that piece of the puzzle has been addressed. But as you look further down the supply chain, I, I think there's an underappreciation for, you know, for the need to get to scale and that that link between impact, right? So if you want to have an impact on sustainability, on decarbonization, on the circular world, right? That means you need to get products to large scale and that means having manufacturing capacity. And as I think everyone on the panel, you know, can commiserate with today, the, the industry as a, at large has a, has a capacity crunch, right? You, you've heard, you know, Poe talk about it, you heard Kevin talk about it. Um, there's simply is just not that much capacity available and the capacity that does exist um, is priced extremely high today because of that capacity crunch. So to have that impact, that means we need to have those manufacturing assets um, and that means capital. Right. And so you, you've heard Poe and you've heard others talk about the challenges of capital today. But if we're going to transform how the world makes chemicals, it means having the capacity to scale. Right. So not only the technological ability to do it quickly and efficiently, but it means putting steel in the ground. Right. And there's a lot that can be done on the policy side uh, to encourage that, to encourage long term investments by both the public and the private sector to enable you know, the, this industry to get there quicker and, and faster and more efficiently. So, uh, This is a perfect segue. Thank you um, all, to all the panelists. So we have now opened the questions from the Q&A. So also to all the participants, if you have a question, please put it into the Q&A box. If you want a certain um, if one of the questions interests you more, please upvote it and we will try and cover as many as we can. Um, to follow on from what, what, what Matt was saying, um, Arno Legris has said, how do scaling challenges differ between traditional chemical industry versus biotech applied to chemistry? And I'd love to open the floor to the panelists, but specifically Matt, 
due to his background. So Matt, would you like to start the floor? Uh, sure. So historically in the precision fermentation space, scaling has been hard, right? If you go back 15, 20 years, um, the stories are legends. Some of the early pioneers, um, some that did it well, some that really struggled, but it, it took it took years and it took hundreds of millions of dollars to get the same performance at pilot, at demo, and then full commercial scale, um, you know, at, as, that they had demonstrated in the lab. And it just, it just took, you know, a long time. And you can contact me offline. We can go into the reasons why that is. But that's one of the areas that we've addressed from a technology side. You know, that, like I said, at the, at the onset, our technology was specifically designed to be predictive across scale. So we, are, we now have data that shows when we have an improvement in the micro fermentation or very small scale, we know that that will be conserved, that we will get that same performance as we go larger and larger in scale. Um, so there are, and we're not the only one, there are ways that you can go about doing this. There are some exemplary companies that have done fantastic work in getting to scale. The crux of it is how can you do it faster and cheaper and more efficiently, right? And that's one of the solutions that we provide. So. Um, Kevin Poe Thomas, do you have any other answers to that question? Yeah, I would like to say that um, an area that we in particular focus on and have quite a broad number of investments in is ways of doing the biomanufacturing without the massive steel scale. These are earlier stage companies. They're less proven than the traditional methods, but trying to essentially change the economics of scaling itself to make it more modular in its pricing, um, being able to use plastic where we're using steel and the like. And uh, low water systems, so less volume, uh, higher cell densities, using different forms of energy in the bioreactor to be able to enable higher forms of density. Uh, and they're all very exciting uh, to be able to sort of hope that that could sort of change the economics of scaling itself on a fundamental level. Um, you know, where chemistry has had a long time to get to do its work in 3 million liters. And bio hasn't even approached the basic unit of, of chemistry in this space. Uh, and the, but I would say that like the economics uh, uh, of doing bio versus chemistry are also being disrupted technologically with essentially uh, everybody on this panel is well aware of how electrochemistry and, you know, Thomas mentioned cell-free systems, these sort of alternative approaches to doing the same transformation of matter, the same, I take two nitrogens, I got to break this triple, famous triple covalent bond, I got to add some H's and O's, and I'm transforming matter from dinitrogen to, say, ammonia for fertilizer or energy storage. And these same steps, there's another whole sort of toolbox in electrochemistry that, and it's in the same way that sort of pulling the enzymes out of a microbe and working with those enzymes as their own state in a stabilized form is yet is already been, you know, an alternative to straight up symbio. And, and in this way, those, if those work and those work in certain markets, that too sort of changes the inherent scaling question um, through essentially just the laws of physics. I might just add that, you know, at the end of the day, I think the scaling of chemistry and biology, the challenges will become quite the same. And the fact that they're different today is more a reflection of the relative maturity of the two disciplines, right? And in scaling chemistry, uh, oftentimes you sp and speak of things like being verbunden, right? The, the integration of all the inputs and outputs to achieve maximum efficiency, functionality, and cost, right? That's where we'll get with biology. And you know, it is true that for biology, it, it, it has the potential to be quite more modular given the number of inputs is relatively well-defined at least today. So I, I think that is an advantage. And part of that advantage also that means that we can get to economies of scale at a, at a lower volume than, than some of the major existing chemical processes. So I think that is an advantage. 
But as the industry continues to mature, it will become more about integration and waste management and all the things that the chemistry industry has been struggling with. And hopefully we can learn from that experience and more rapidly it integrate it into biological manufacturing processes. Yeah, so I'll be quick to, I'll be quick to, can you hear me? Okay. I'll be quick on the uh, uh, on this one. Uh, it's uh, looking from the chemical uh, industry perspective. So uh, we go through three steps, basically to three steps with some few ex exceptions when we need to scale a process, right? So we start at the lab, we go to a pilot slash demo, and then we go to the to the plant. That's uh, indeed, it's, uh, it's because it's an industry that is mature enough to master that process pretty well. So, and, and, and in, bi in biology, we, we are not yet there, even if we've been seeing the last years a lot going on in that space once again, and the predictability becoming something more present. And that's really important because uh, 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 that impacts a lot the economics of, uh, of any uh, uh, of any option in the uh, in the in the biology space, right? So our ability to uh, to quickly go uh, is not only about the money we'll need to spend to go to the next scale, but also the time that it takes to get to the final product at the right scale and reach the market. And I think that's that's uh, once again it's uh, uh, it's uh, improving a lot. And uh, and I and I think that in in uh, in some years from now we'll be talking about uh, a biology as we talk about the chemical industry, uh, an industry that is in a position to be, to predict pretty well how to move to the to the to the very less scale from few trials done in a, in a lower scale. Just adding some insights to what the others have already said. And Right. So keep in mind the petrochemical industry has a 170 year head start. I mean, that that's incredible. Right. So we need to sort of temper expectations accordingly. Right. So the modern sin bio, you know, ecosystem is what generously 30 years. Right. So, you know, 150 year head start is, is an enormous advantage over an industry. Right. But then I think you also have to think about it from a feedstock perspective as well, right? If, if you were to ask a, you know, a chemist to design sort of the perfect energy dense material, right? Petroleum is kind of it. <laughs> like it, it doesn't get any better than that if you look at fundamental thermodynamics, right? But then it also has implications, right? It also means that you have to, so you know, to Kevin's point on scale, right? There also hasn't been a, a new refinery built in decades because it costs Billion, multiple billions of dollars, tens of billions of dollars to do that because it has to be the size of a medium-sized city to actually achieve those economics, right? So biology doesn't have to compete with that, right? You know, if you look at just sort of one early example, if you look at sort of even just the first-gen ethanol plants, you know, in the sort of early 2000s, right? Hundreds of those were built because you could, it was guaranteed, you get 100 million, you know, gallon per year capacity for a, a dollar per gallon of installed CapEx, right? So granted, that was a first-gen process. It was ethanol. You get the idea. But the point being, you can build you know, many facilities that are much more regional, that are in tune with the supply chain, that address these problems, things that you simply cannot do with petrochemistry, again, because you need to build a refinery the size of a medium city in order to get those same levels of sort of you know, economic advantages. So I think it just, it's important to sort of temper those expectations. And, and I fully agree with what Kevin and what Tomas have said, right? It, it will get there, right? There are some challenges, um, certainly some things that we need to overcome, but we're making you know, incredible progress and having the support and the pull from the market and from some big players like Salve and others, that's game changing for the industry, for the world. I will add one, one little quick bit, which is while that uh, being 88% 80, carbon, uh, oil has been nearly the perfect feedstock and we have become the most efficient industry in the world using every molecule for of that fraction for a different market. But what we saw when during COVID, when we all stopped taking uh, jet plane trips, um, all of a sudden that fraction wasn't being used and made. And, and a lot of uh, in the oil and gas sort of supply chains uh, reduced capacity because they couldn't essentially sell jet fuel. And all of a sudden we saw these 
whipsaws and plastic prices. We saw uh, throughout, throughout the fraction, we saw all sorts of disruption. So essentially what bio, synthetic biology and biochemistry is essentially competing, though within the same companies, with oil as a feedstock, oil itself, all it takes is a little bit of cr uh, cracking in that fraction and the economics of that fraction for the whole thing to kind of start to unweave like a sweater because it's used to this nearly perfect economics. And I think that is a critical thing to be paying attention to, certainly as an investor, when you're thinking about replacing uh, oil as a feedstock with something like other forms of carbon, uh, be it sugar or uh, bagasse or lignin or CO2 from the air, as Thomas was describing. Thank you. I think it's incredibly interesting um, to have the sort of parallels between the incumbent chemistry industry and the bio that we're seeing. Um, in terms of, in the interest of time, so I know we only have four minutes and we've covered, honestly, a variety of topics and I think it's been very good. One thing that I would like to ask is if you had one key takeaway message, what would it be? And I'd love to start off with, uh, from based on my screen, Kevin, Matt, and then Poe, and then Thomas. So if you could give us one key message from this webinar, um, that would be fantastic. All right. Well, I'll, I'll start, but I, I, I don't claim to have, have any particularly cogent uh, message that is true across all the participants in, in the webinar, right? So, but from a Ginkgo perspective, um, I, I think a, a, a key message is to uh, to learn from the past, uh, but don't be afraid to take chances on something new, right? And so, and I think that's what our industry is going to have to do uh, to succeed, right? So Ginkgo um, took the bold initiative to consolidate, to take more of a platform approach um, to cell engineering and synthetic biology. And I think uh, we're starting to establish a track record to, proves that that could be a prudent uh, investment. I look forward to others uh, taking similar initiatives in their er areas of the economy. So. Uh, so I guess adding on what, what Kevin had said, you know, I think our, we are cautiously optimistic. We're excited about what the future holds. You know, I think having lived through you know, industrial biotech 1.0 and some of the challenges that we saw there. Uh, we've done our best at DMC to avoid uh, making those same mistakes. Uh, so I think we feel pretty well positioned there. We're excited by what we see from consumers, from strategics, and from now governments you know, around the world. So I think it, it is a time for optimism. And I think at the same time, we also feel the pressure to deliver. So you've heard others say that as well, right? Uh, unfortunately, our industry has a, uh, a less than stellar history, a track record of delivering on the promises that we make. And so I think we're feeling that pressure now more than ever, right? The importance to deliver on, on the products and the biochemistries and the technologies that, that we're all very excited about. So, My key message is a beat I mentioned at the beginning, which is to recast this world of threat and doom and gloom as challenge, the excitement of getting to work on really hard and meaningful things, and to be in the state of mind that enables our creativity. Because I think that the threat and the doom and gloom, um, sometimes people come up with things in desperate times, but on some level, it defeats the very state of mind we need to be in to accomplish this. Just for encouragement, in Clean Tech 1.0, there's a lot of scars. But back then, we're competing against the price of oil. Today, we're competing against parts per million in the atmosphere. And that is not going down. That is continuing to go up. So let's keep up the really good work. And I just thank everybody for coming today.
Tomas, would you like to have your last take home message? Yeah, so it's uh, it has to be a very quick one. So it's uh, for, uh, the mo the moment is unique for for synthetic biology for biology as uh, uh, for biotechnology as a whole and for synthetic biology. Uh, the pandemic uh, also brought uh, uh, more awareness on on what what, ca what can be done through biology, which is great. Uh, the, there is this drive uh, for sustainability that is also that also brings uh, 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 traction. So it's all good. On the other hand, it's also paradoxical. Uh, we need to look around us. Uh, uh, it's not an easy moment to take uh, uh, bold decisions, but we need to be brave and make them because we are not we are not investing uh, for the next two or three years. We're investing for the next decade or, or so. So it's important to make the decisions right now. And so what I would say is uh, uh, it's that. And I would uh, uh, take advantage to to thank against uh, again uh, all the panelists for the discussion. Uh, thanks Rainbow for the facilitation and thanks the audience for being here with us for this great discussion. And if you want to continue this this discussion in person, Solvi will be present at the Hello Tomorrow Global Summit. Alternatively, uh, feel free to keep in touch via uh, our newsletter, other events or LinkedIn. It's a passionate topic, right? So that welcomes passionate discussions. I'll be ready for that. Thank you and take care. I'd like to echo some of Thomas's words. Thank you so much to the panelists, Kevin, Matt, Poe and Thomas. You guys have been fantastic. I know that the participants, um, that the attendees would have learned quite a lot. So thank you for your time. Um, echoing again what Thomas was saying, Solve will be attending the Global Summit. Um, in March in Paris. So if you are interested, please come by, talk to us in person. We'd love to hear and continue discuss discussion. Alternatively, feel free to keep in touch via our newsletters, other events, or LinkedIn. And with that, I'd like to draw this webinar to a close. And I hope you have a very good day. See you.